Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. This morning I'll be reading from John chapter 20, and I'll be reading verses 1 through 9. And this is what it says. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. And she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciples set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the Scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Pray with me. Jesus, open up Scripture to us today, that we might hear your voice, we might see your hand, and that the Easter story might not just be an old story that happened long ago, that it might be our story this day. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> a little while back, I was in a retail store, and I, it was a slow business day, and I struck up a conversation with the fellow that was helping me out. He was a young guy. He was college age, and uh, when we struck up a conversation, I noticed that his eyes kept darting to the television that was behind me. It was a motorcycle race that he was watching, and well, to be frank, that I'm sure that motorcycle race was a lot more interesting than I am. And, but I thought I might hazard a guess. I said, um, do you ride a motorcycle? Well, then he kind of came, came to life and he said, yeah, I do. I said, do you have a street bike? He said, yes, I do. I said, what do you have? Well, then he began to talk about his, his, his street bike. And we began to swap motorcycle stories and, and, and riding experiences and, and, and he just came to life. And, and I tried my best to keep from, from saying it. I tried my best to hold back, I, I, but, but it just plopped right out. The dad in me came out. I said, oh, do be careful. <laughs> and I said, the, the worst bang up I ever had was when I got off a motorcycle when I should have stayed on it. And I said, I had a bruise the size of a volleyball and it was the color of an eggplant. I said, there wasn't one bit of Caucasian in the whole thing. He said, oh, I know the kind of bruise you're talking about. I was attacked by an elephant one time. <laughs> well, you know, what, 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 how do you respond to something? I was attacked by an elephant one time. I, I can't say, well, you know, yes, I know what that's like. I was chased by a dog one time. Yeah, no, it's just a story that's, that's so big. The only thing left to say is, wow, tell me more. 
That's the story right here. It's a story that's so big that, that, that about the only thing to do is to say, wow, tell me more. There's no response like, yeah, I remember when I was crucified, dead and buried. No, it's, it's, it's a story. That, it's why we're here. It's the story we came to listen to. It's the story that cries out, wow, tell me more. And there's plenty to tell. The story begins early on the first day of the week while it was still dark. Now, that's not a throwaway line. That this is the Gospel of John, and the Gospel of John is first and foremost a creation story. It begins the same way that Genesis starts. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That The Gospel of John is a creation story. And everyone who knows the creation story from Genesis knows that the creation story begins on the first day of the week. We know that the creation story takes place in a garden. And that's where Mary is. She goes to see the body of Jesus, not the risen Christ. She goes to see a corpse. Because when the Romans kill people, they stay dead. Nobody measured in death better than the Romans. They had, they had crucified thousands upon thousands of people. They were highly experienced at it. And nobody at the end of a Roman crucifixion said, well, you know what? I bet they might still be alive. No, dead. They knew they were dead. She came to see the body, the corpse of Jesus. So it was on the first day of the week there in the garden. And instead of seeing the body, she sees that the stones rolled away, and she runs to tell Peter and another disciple. Well, Peter and and John, that other disciple, they run toward the tomb, and John's a little younger, so John gets there first, but Peter runs straight past him into the tomb, and then the two of them go in, and they see not the body, but the linen wrappings that Jesus was in. They see them over to the side, and it says, and they saw and believed. Well, that's a head-scratcher right there. What is it that they saw and believed? Because it tells us just the very next verse that they went home. And a few verses later, the very next story, it tells us they went home and shut the door for fear. Well, if you see and believe, it doesn't seem like you'll be huddled in fear behind closed locked doors, but that's where they are. They go home, and it's Mary Magdalene who stays there in the garden. She's weeping, and two angels appear. Well, she doesn't recognize them as angels. And one of them speaks to her and says, why are you weeping? She said, because they've taken his body. And then the second person that speaks to to Mary is Jesus. And she doesn't recognize him either. And he says, Why are you weeping? Whom do you seek? What is it that you you seek? What is it that you pursue? What is it that you're looking for? Whom do you seek? And that's when Mary thought he was the gardener and said, if you know where they've taken, taken him, tell me, and I will take his body. And that's when Jesus, Jesus says her name. He says, Mary. And that's when her eyes were opened. And she calls out to him and she says, Rabboni. And, and it's in, in seeking after Jesus that we find. That's where the, the big story 2,000 years ago becomes our story. That's where the rubber meets the road. That's where the connection is made. That in the pursuit of Jesus and seeking Jesus and the, the looking for Jesus, that that our eyes are open and he says our name. He knows you by name, he knows my name, and he calls us by name, not just a long time, he calls us by name today. For those who take time to listen, he, he calls our name today. Well, she responds and she hugs him and he says, stop clinging to me for I've not yet ascended to my father and your father, to my God and your God. Go and tell the disciples. 
Well, Mary goes to the disciples. They're at their home with the door shut for fear, as I said. And that's where Jesus appears. He appears behind those shut, closed doors. And the first words in the middle of their fear that he says, the first words are, peace be with you. That it's in that dark and lonely place, that shut, shut up place that, that, that seems like nobody else is. That's where Jesus appears. And he says, peace be with you. And then he showed them his hands where he was crucified. He shows them his side where the centurion got the spear and, and stabbed him in the side. And then it tells us that he opened his mouth and breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. His first words were, peace be with you, and his second were, receive the Holy Spirit, that he opened his mouth and breathed on them. This is a creation story. In the old creation, it took place on the first day of the week. The old creation took place in a garden. The old creation, it was when God breathed into Adam's nostrils the breath of life that he became a living being. And now in the new creation, here in the garden, here on the first day of the week, that God breathes He breathes into his disciples the same way then that he he breathes into disciples now the power of his Holy Spirit, the risen Christ. That's where we, the rubber meets the road. That's where we make contact. That's where his story becomes our story. And that story is a story of life, a life, a new life, a new creation right here in the middle of the old creation that he ushers in to your life and mine. And the story doesn't stop there. It's in Luke chapter 24. It tells us that two of the disciples, obviously disciples that weren't here, that they were walking along the Emmaus Road talking about the things that had happened that day, the things that Mary saw and the disciples saw. And they're talking about it when they begin to walk with a stranger. Well, they don't recognize the stranger, but the stranger is the risen Christ. And he asks them, what are you talking about? And they said, well, are you the only one in all of Israel who hasn't heard that Jesus, Nazareth, the one that, that we thought was going to redeem Israel, that he was crucified, and this is the third day, and the tomb is empty. Some are saying that he's alive, and And they began to walk with him, and they walked with him all the way to to the city of Emmaus, not recognizing who he is. And, And it's that night in the breaking of bread that Jesus gives a prayer of praise and thanks. And it's in that prayer of praise and thanks that it tells us their eyes were open, and they recognize the risen Christ. And they said, did our hearts not burn within us? That it's in the, the, the prayer of praise and thanks. Not thanks to goodness, not thanks to, to, to good luck, not thanks to good fortune. It's thanks to God that our eyes are open and we begin to, to see, to see miracles. The risen Christ, his hand moving in our world today. And that's the first thing that I want to talk about. Where the rubber meets the road, a new life, where contact to that old story begins in the here and the now, is a life lived in in praise and thanks to God. Read a story about a woman who's pastor of of a little church. Oh, she loved the church and the church dearly loved her. That was all except for two cranky old farmers. Yeah, they just couldn't say anything nice to her, couldn't say anything nice to anybody. And somebody in the church pulled her aside and said, you know, these two old fellows, they, they go fishing every Friday morning early. And I'll just bet you, if you went fishing with them, they'd learn to love you the way the rest of us do. And they'd, they'd, they'd be changed. Well, after church one day, she saw him and she said, I understand that you all go fishing early on Friday mornings. If you'll have me, I'd love to go fishing with you sometime. 
They looked at each other and they said, we leave from the diner at 530. If you're late, we'll be gone. Well, she got there early on Friday morning and they all went to the lake together. They got into the boat and went out on the lake and she caught the first fish. Well, they weren't too happy about that and they just kind of grumbled under their breath. And if they didn't like that, they liked it even less. She caught the next five fish. And then after that, she said, you know, I'm a little chilly and left my sweater in the car. She stepped out of the boat, walked on the water all the way back to the parking lot to get her sweater. And that's when one farmer turned to the other one and said, wouldn't you know it, she can't even swim. <laughs> so often it is that we can't see the miracles of God, the hand of God, the new life, the new creation going on all, all around us because we get caught up in grumpiness. We get caught up in, in being a critic. We get caught up in how what is isn't what should be. We get caught up in the complaining, and it's easy to do. We live in a world that loves to complain, and it strikes what's most natural in us, what's most natural in that old creation. But Jesus... Jesus rose from the grave in order to usher in a new creation, a new life, where the rubber meets the road in your life and in mine, and to start that new life today. Not where we sit on the throne to complain, critique, and, and to instruct, but where we sit at the foot to give praise to give thanks and to recognize that God is God and that we are not. And it's in that, that, that prayer of praise, in that prayer of thanks to God that our eyes are open. Jesus taught his disciples to pray saying, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That his name is holy. His name is hallowed. It's worthy of praise. It's worthy of thanks. And prayer isn't sitting and telling God the things we want God to do. It's that prayer of praise and thanks. And that's where our eyes are open to the new creation that's, that, that's taking place right here in the middle of the old creation in your life and mine. Live a life of in praise and thanks. But not only that, that new life, new life that, that starts today in your life and mine is a life that, well, it's a life that's lived in faith. It's lived in faith. Read a story about a chief of police of a large city that he was given the, the prayer breakfast devotion one morning to a group of fellows and, and he was talking about something that had happened in his city. He said the police officer had made a routine traffic stop. What the officer didn't realize is that the driver of the car had just robbed a grocery store. Well, the officer didn't know it and when the officer was approaching the car, the driver, the robber jumped out of the car and shot the officer twice squarely in the, in the chest. What the robber didn't know is the officer was wearing a bulletproof vest. It knocked him to the ground, but when the officer started to get back up, <laughs> the, the robber thought he'd shot RoboCop, so he threw his gun down and, and threw his hands in the air. He said, I'm not armed. Don't shoot. Don't shoot. I'm not armed. And then the chief of police began to to contrast that story to another story that happened in a nearby city. He said an officer was going to a domestic call. He didn't expect any trouble there. It was a hot day, and rather than wearing his bulletproof vest, he left his vest in the trunk of his car. He said he approached the house, and when he knocked on the door, he didn't realize it, but the person on the other side of the door was so afraid that they shot through the door, not knowing who it was. Well, the person shot through the door and killed the officer that was on the other side of the door. 
And in his devotion, the chief of police went on to say, every police officer believes in bulletproof vests. They work. I doubt you could find a policeman anywhere who doesn't believe these vests save lives. But that's not enough. An officer must do more than believe in vests. He must take his belief to the point of personal commitment. He must be willing to wear the vest and wear it at all times, even when it's hot, even when it's uncomfortable. And in a similar way, it's not enough to believe that a man named Jesus lived 2,000 years ago. We must take that belief to the point of commitment. We must be willing to take that belief to the point of putting on the risen Christ to receive him as Savior and Lord. To receive him. To receive the risen Christ as Savior means that we trust, that we trust that what he did on the cross, that it was enough, that it was enough to save us from that old creation, the old creation that would crush us in guilt, the old creation that would crush us in shame, in sin, the old creation that would crush us in fear and in sorrow, that Jesus took on. All those things that would crush us, all those things that would destroy us. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says that Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin on our behalf in order that we might be made right with God, that he took on all those things from the old creation that would crush and kill and destroy us. And he nailed it to the cross to take away its power once and for all, for you and for me. That's where the rubber meets the road. That's where he saves us from an old creation that would destroy us. And he rose again on the, the third day that he might live his life through us. And that not only did he save us from the old creation, but we can follow him as the Lord, as the leader of our life in this new creation where the power of his spirit that we 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 put on his spirit is the way the bible talks about it sometimes in Romans 13:14 that we put on his spirit as the the armor of god as the book of ephesians sometimes talks about it that he protects us and that we can lean on him rely on him, have faith in him and trust Him as we live in the here and now. Sometimes the Bible talks about the, the Spirit of Christ as, as, as the breath of God, as it does here in the, the, the resurrection story. That it's not that He's just around us, that He's as close as our very own breath and lives on the inside of us. Sometimes, uh, as it talks about in the book of Galatians, that He walks beside us. But whether it's beside, inside, or around us, it's that the risen Christ has power that you and I don't have. Power enough where we can follow him, where we can obey him. That we don't set up a list of tasks as if we're the ones that sit on the throne and this, God, this is what I want you to do. That we follow and that we obey in a life of faith. That every day we put on Christ, we breathe in Christ, we walk beside him in the here and now. And that's where the rubber meets the road. That's where that old story becomes our story. To live life in faith. To live a life in praise and thanks. And the last thing that I want to talk about this morning, to live a, a new life in in healing love. Now, there's some things that we pursue and there's some things that ensue. We pursue things, that, that's what we seek, like, like Mary did. The things that we, we, we look for, the, the direction that we're going, there's some things that ensue. Those are things that follow. Those are things that, that come after. And I think fairly often people pursue, pursue healing love and to pursue healing love it's not very often at all that we'll hit Christ that we pursue Jesus the risen Christ and what ensues what follows what comes after 
is a healing love with a strength and a power that we don't have on our own. I read a story about a fella who um, had lived in Alaska about five or six months. He had been there just five or six months when one day he ran into a Catholic priest. And he turned to the priest. He said, Father, I'm glad that I, that I saw you today. He said, I've only been in Alaska five or six months and I don't believe in prayer anymore. The priest said, well, tell me more. He said, well, it was about four or five months ago. I was with a group of friends and we were out hunting. He said, I got separated from the group. And, and then it began to, to get dark. And then it, it began to get cold. And I, and I prayed that God would rescue me. He said, then it began to snow. And I prayed more that God would rescue me. But God didn't rescue me. And, and now I don't believe in prayer anymore. And the priest said, well, I'm confused. You're standing here in front of me now. He said, oh, well, that was the locals. They're the ones that found me. Well, I have good news this morning. God still uses the locals. He lives his life through ordinary locals, well, like you and like me. That it's not just an old story that today is where the rubber meets the road. Today is the day that the risen Christ lives through locals like, like you and me. And that he lives through us in a healing love that makes whole with a strength that we don't have the power to make whole. With a healing love that bears burdens where, where we don't have power enough. It's stronger than, than any natural love, any human love that exists. It's the power of the risen Christ in a healing love that, that lives through you and me. It's what follows. It's what ensues. It's what comes after that relationship with Jesus Christ. And it's available to you and me today. And that's that's the love that this world is longing for. A love that, well, it doesn't just love folks when they're lovable. It doesn't forgive when, just when they're forgivable. It doesn't bear a burden just when it's light. It's a love that has the strength of the risen Christ that forgives. That bears the burden when we don't have that strength. And it's where the rubber meets the road. Where he lives his life in your life and in mine. This morning... It may be that uh, you've not known the power of the risen Christ. You knew the old story, but you, you've never invited Christ to, to, to put on the risen Christ. You've never invited him to, to live as the, in your life the way that, that you breathe in air. You've never walked beside him. And so you've never trusted that what he did on the cross was enough to forgive you. It was strength enough to have power over, the, over that old creation, over the old life. And you'd like to invite him into to your life today to trust that what he did on the cross was enough. Enough to save you from that old, old creation. And that you want to follow him as your Lord. Well, I want to pray with you this morning. Let's pray. Jesus, it's this old story. May it never stay in the book. But Lord, may it become a part of our lives, who we are. That we pursue you, Jesus, in prayer and praise and thanks. That we pursue you, Jesus, in, in a faith that, that, that puts on Christ, that breathes in Christ, that walks with Christ every day. And that it's in this relationship that we begin to, to follow you as, as Lord, the leader of our lives. Lord, it may be that there are folks that, 
that today, this is the first day of a new life, and they've invited you in, that they might know your strength. And there are others, Lord, that it may, might be that they de- did that years ago, but there's enough brokenness and bitterness in this world that uh, they've, they're shut behind closed doors of fear or of heartache. And they've let some elements of that, that old creation creep into the new creation that you, you breathed into them. And it's a healing love. It's your healing love that, that ensues, that follows. Lord, breathe that healing love, that wholeness today. And to us locals, that we might go into a world that needs to know who you are. We ask for your power, that power we don't have. For greater it is he who is in us than he who is in the world. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, Just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15 a.m. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, Thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. Hi, thank you for joining us. My name's Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Our mission here at RUMC is to help people live a Christ-centered life. We're a welcoming church, we're a biblical church, and we're a compassionate church. That the, we believe that the way that, that God made us, that he made us in his image. And what the Bible tells us is that his image is an us, is an our. When God said in the creation story, let us create humans in our image. He made us to be in community together. He made us to connect to him and one another. That's the place that this is at Roswell United Methodist Church, a place of community and faith. I want to invite you to join us. It might be online, it might be through social media, or it might be here in person. We meet at 9 o'clock in a contemporary service with a band. We also have two 1115 services. One is here in the sanctuary with a traditional choir and organ. We also meet at 1115 with a band in our chapel. Thank you for joining us, and I look forward to meeting you.